Good morning. How are y'all? <laughs> My name is Eric Monday, and I serve in finance and administration here at the university and also have the opportunity to serve as one of the co-chairs for the Provost Search Committee. Thank you all so much for being here, everyone in this audience, and of course, following us online as well. Today, it is our uh, opportunity to welcome Dave Blackwell, the Dean of the Gatton College of Business and Economics here at the university, as our second candidate for the Provost Search 2017. We've asked Dean Blackwell to make some opening comments around the topic of understanding the current state of higher education. Please share your vision, your thoughts, and priorities for the Office of the Provost. After Dean Blackwell makes some opening comments, we'll have time and plenty of opportunity for questions from the audience, as well as questions that are submitted online or via the Twitter account. So let me go over a few of those details. If you're here in the auditorium, there's two ways to ask questions. You can go to one of the microphones that are on other, either side of the room, or you can raise your hand and we have colleagues from HR and public relations that are available here to give you a note card. We can collect those note cards and then I'll ask those questions that are coming from the audience as well as note cards that are filled out by HR and PR that we're receiving from email and Twitter. The email address is provostsearch, one word, at uky.edu, provostsearch at uky.edu. As well as taking questions on Twitter by tweeting at ukyprovost. Our search website is uky.edu slash president slash provostsearch. And we are seeking, of course, your comments on our candidates. And that, that form is available on that website. And that will be available for receipt of comments until noon on December 12th. Thank you for being here. And let's welcome Dean Blackwell. I'm on? Good. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming out on a bitterly cold Friday morning. Uh, I'm, like you, I'm looking forward to Friday afternoon. But um, I'm very happy to be here this morning. Um, I uh, am honored to be considered for the role of provost of the University of Kentucky. And what I want to accomplish this morning are a few things. One is to uh, honor, honor my assignment, which is to uh, just give my view of the state of higher education with some specific uh, references to what our situation here is at UK. Uh, also, uh, I want to explain to you why I actually want the job and why I think I have the right set of, of, of skills uh, at this particular point in time to help, help UK to thrive. Uh, also, uh, time permitting, I'll, I'll touch a bit on my vision for the office of the provost, uh, how the office of the provost should function. And then uh, I see some immediate priorities for the new provost. I mean, from, from day one, things that need to, to get done or focused on. And then uh, I'll talk about maybe some, some longer term priorities that uh, might come into play uh, after the first 90 to 100 days. Uh, and then once I get through all of that, and I'll try to be very efficient, uh, I hope we have a, a conversation about what your issues are, because a big part of these meetings today is so that I can learn uh, uh, from you and translate that into uh, uh, some of the uh, vision for the job, and especially as, as I, if I advance to the next level, uh, as I get into discussions with, with the president and other members of the leadership team about moving forward, that I have some sense of what is, uh, what is going on out in the community. <clears throat> this is going to be a challenge this morning, so, so forgive me. Uh, the current state of higher ed, and I, 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 I 
think everybody in this room is in higher ed, so you, you, you probably read the same publications I read. Um, you, you, you probably, um, your, your, your feet are on the ground, um, uh, so to speak, and, and so I know you feel some of the challenges and, and, and some of the opportunities that we face. But uh, the current state, the, the overall issue I see is that it's becoming more competitive, much more competitive. And part of that is because of demographics, and it's well known that uh, the demographics of, of college age students is going against us. Um, if you think about the fact that we have a huge fixed infrastructure and a very large uh, portion of our, our budget is fixed cost, uh, that you know, that, that uh, shrinking demographic is problematic for us going forward. So universities around the country and around the world even are, are competing, you know, for, for essentially a, a pool of students that is e either flat or maybe even, even shrinking over the next few years. Um, another another uh, part of that competition is the challenge of recognizing how the current generations of students uh, like to learn. Um, in other words, we can't, we can't just keep um, delivering our product the same way. We can't rest on our laurels and even think that our existing product is, is attractive. We need to really test, uh, test our ideas in the marketplace, uh, develop programs that are relevant and impactful for students, and make sure that we're delivering those programs in a way that, it, that uh, enables the current generations of students to learn most effectively. Um, diversity and climate is also a part of the competitive landscape. <clears throat> Excuse me. This cold air got me this morning, sorry. Uh, d diversity and, and, and a climate of inclusion is a, an important part of the competitive landscape. If, if, we, if we are not uh, competitive on having a diverse student body, a diverse faculty and staff, and having a campus that is welcoming to everyone where there's a sense of community and where we treat each other with kindness and respect, we're, we're, we're going to lose from the outset. So, I mean, that, that's just sort of a minimum uh, bar that we have to clear to be competitive to be competitive. And, and also technology. I mean, uh, you look around the country, um, there are all sorts of innovations in applying technology to higher education. Uh, some of them are, are being implemented here, but, but, but I have a sense that we are a bit behind the curve there, and that's something that we, we need to think about going forward. There's also an increasing emphasis, and this is nationwide, on, on ROI, or return on investment. Um, Another way of putting it is, you know, affordability and, uh, versus outcomes. And uh, parents and their, and their children are, are looking at not only student success issues on campus, but employment success. And so to be competitive, we're going to have to show that we are able to bring in students from modest backgrounds and actually transform their lives and help them move up the academic and economic ladder uh, in order to sustain um, uh, our value proposition. Um, so affordability, student success, and then uh, focusing on how we help our students to, uh, to advance either to graduate school or to uh, meaningful employment. Uh, most recently, uh, last, last month or so, um, the landscape has gotten even more complex um, because of taxes, tax, the tax law and, and other regulation. The, the tax law has p potential to be very disruptive. Uh, of course, we, we all are aware that the tax law, uh, as, as it sits right now, um, I think in the Senate version, at least has a, a provision to tax graduate um, uh, tuition waivers. Uh, that would have a drastic effect on our campus and campuses around the country. Uh, we have to be thinking about that uh, and, and prepared to, to deal with what comes. 
Um, the, the, the other more subtle element is uh, that there also is a proposal to tax employee tuition benefits. Okay, so that, that, that would affect a lot of staff, in particular at the University of Kentucky, and would dramatically increase the cost to the university of providing an important employee benefit to our staff. So I think that's another element of, of the current tax law that or is being proposed that we need to consider. And then regulation, uh, in, in more generally, uh, the, the Senate Education Committee has drafted a bill, uh, as I read about it, it's 542 pages long. Um, it, it, so there's a lot buried in there. Um, whether that bill gets to see the light of day or not, we don't know. Um, it's just come out of the Senate committee. But one, one thing that it does do is it, it rolls back some of the Obama era regulations on non, on profit, for profit uh, entities and places more emphasis on uh, performance fund, performance based funding uh, for the federal dollars. It uh, puts more emphasis, it, it actually opens up the field more for for-profit universities in terms of, uh, of you know, less, less regulation there. And that, that affects our landscape as well, and we need to, to stay on top of where that bill heads. And then overarching everything is the, uh, our funding and our sustainability. Uh, there are, um, uh, we, we, don't, we don't expect that the state appropriation, for example, is going to remain level. And we need to be thinking aggressively about how we plan for that. We, we, we cannot let that be disruptive. We have to plan and execute carefully. And there actually are steps uh, going on on campus right now to plan for, for that disruption. So for, for the University of Kentucky specifically, um, we've, we've got to stabilize our enrollment. And we've got to think about where uh, we want our enrollment to grow and how, how we grow it. Given, given the environment we, we, uh, of, of reduced funding, potential reduced funding, uh, enrollment is going to have to grow because we are not going to be able to uh, aggressively increase tuition because of the affordability issue. So uh, how, how we grow, uh, how fast we grow, and in what areas we grow are areas of, of concern. And we have to look at it both at the graduate and undergraduate level. Um, of course, planning for, for, for uh, state funding cuts is essential for us in the immediate future. And we have to continue to focus on student success, uh, not only retention, of course, graduation, but then I think we, we need to be thinking about demonstrating uh, with, with data and, and, and with uh, uh, outcomes that we are actually improving the lives of our graduates in a, in a meaningful way. And how, so how do we demonstrate that? I think that's a huge part of the value proposition, not only to parents and the children of prospective, or parents of prospective students, but also to the public and, and to the legislature. And uh, I think we do a good job on improving social mobility of, of, of our graduates, but we have to figure out the best way to communicate that. Um, and then there's, there's uh, I, as I look around campus uh, and think about how we grow, especially at the graduate level, I think there are some structural issues that have to be resolved to foster uh, more interdisciplinary research and more interdisciplinary graduate programs, master's programs in particular that have the potential to generate substantial revenue. Uh, the, the, the governance process is uh, not clear on, on how uh, if, if, two, if two academic units come together and want to offer a joint degree, how, how is that degree structured? Which unit offers the degree? Who owns the students? Um, you know, a host of budget issues surrounding, surrounding uh, those kinds of programs. And I think that we, we've got to resolve those so that, uh, so that there's a clear path to establishing those programs. Uh, I think the, the bottom line for, for us is that we, need, we do need to grow uh, to be sustainable, um, but the growth needs to be smart. And, and that comes in two directions, uh, enrollment 
So academic programs, of course, but um, also, uh, actually three, uh, do, you know, tech, applying technology appropriately and, 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 and what opportunities we have to do things uh, that make sense online, but also the research enterprise. Um, we, we've, got, uh, we've got to grow the research enterprise to remain sustainable. And, uh, you know, the, a, lot of, a lot of funding, especially in support of, of graduate education and research infrastructure around campus, comes because of external research funding. And, and then, of course, diversity will always be an issue. Uh, again, it's a, it, it is a moral imperative that, that we, um, we address diversity, but it is also a competitive necessity. So that, that means the, the next provost really needs to be a strong partner with the EVP FA, the EVP HA, the Vice President for Diversity, uh, the Vice President for Research in particular, uh, and of course all the deans. It goes without saying that the provost will, will work with all the deans, but um, uh, there, there, there needs to be a strong collaboration among all of those entities to address uh, the serious challenges ahead. We, we do start from a very uh, strong position, so you know, the challenges are there, but there's always been challenges in higher ed. I mean, I've, I've been in higher ed over 30 years, and there's never been a time when it's all rosy. So we're, we're accustomed to, to doing, doing more with less and finding our own way, and, and I have no doubt that the University of Kentucky will thrive uh, even, even though the, the waters may be a bit turbulent in the future. Uh, but let's, let's think about the strengths and, and the very positives, and I have, I have a long list of them. Um, and when I arrived six years ago, I thought one of the big strengths in my college was the excellent faculty. Um, and, and I see that across the university, and I, I see that um, as, as there's been faculty turnover and new hires, the quality of our faculty continues to improve. And we've, we've got a lot of research accomplishments, a lot of, of teaching accomplishments, a lot of national and international visibility uh, as a result of, of, of our faculty, and I think that gives us a, a great starting point. We are, we are definitely, if we're not already world class, we're very, very close to, to having a world class faculty. Um, the facilities are outstanding and getting better. Uh, you know, the, 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 the new research building across the street, of course, the the hospital and healthcare facilities, the new Gatton building, the new science building, the new law school, um, the new student center, residence halls, dining facilities. We are competitive uh, on physical facilities and, and, and now we need to leverage those to, uh, to our great benefit. Uh, I think we have a great geographic location and a very supportive community. That's a strong point not only for attracting students and as we're thinking about enrollment, we need to be thinking non-residents and international students especially because we are already admitting practically every student in Kentucky that, that, that is qualified and wants to come here. So to address the shrinking demographic, we, we've got to go where the students are and start recruiting. And that means we have to sell our community. And I think we've got a strong, a strong selling point there. Um, even, even the growing economy in Kentucky is, is helpful. And the way that it, the way that the economy is growing, I think, is, is very positive, uh, generally with very clean jobs, with technology jobs, and, um, you know, and advanced manufacturing. And I think that, that trajectory uh, of growth creates great opportunity for us in, in terms of partnering to serve workforce needs in the state. Uh, strong community engagement. Um, I, th I think our faculty, our students, are deeply engaged in the community, and that's a huge positive. Um, we've got a very strong brand uh, the brand extends nationwide and, and overseas. Um, we're very low cost, okay? We're very low cost compared to the national market. I mean, when you look even at our non-resident tuition compared to, to the in-state tuition in a lot of states, we're very competitive. So that gives us a, a, a strong starting position for addressing the ROI issue. Um, of course, I mentioned the strong research profile, many outstanding academic programs, uh, a, very, a very strong and continuing uh, to improve a, a, a portfolio of high, high impact educational practices. And the, the, the thing I'll mention last, because it's probably the most important, is a dedicated faculty and staff that genuinely care. 
Um, and I, I see that every day, uh, but where it becomes most poignant for me is, is when I run, in, I run into a parent of a student or an alumni who has a student here and they, they relate stories of I ran into a staff member or a faculty member, I asked for help, they were cheerful, uh, they were friendly. Um, it, it appeared to me that they genuinely cared. And I've heard that story repeatedly. I've heard the, I've heard the president tell that story many times. Um, I think it is genuine here and, and that is a big plus for us in terms of competing uh, uh, nationally. We need to get that message out. The, um, <clears throat> opportunities that we have, uh, de definitely untapped synergies in research. Um, and so what incentives can we create, uh, uh, especially uh, the provost area working with the VPR uh, to, to incentivize more multidisciplinary research and to support those efforts. Um, again, we have the uh, capacity to grow uh, we need to grow, and so uh, the, the opportunity is to, f is to figure out, you know, how, how does it make sense for us to grow and in what areas. Um, in terms of non-traditional education, so I'm talking about online programs, lifelong learning programs that result in some type of credentialing, uh, degree completion, uh, non-credit programs for uh, assisting in workforce development in the state, that there's some of that going on in pockets around campus, but it, it's a virtual blank slate. And it's, that's an area where we can generate significant revenue uh, that can help fill the, you know, the gap that, that we need to address in the budget to continue on a path of excellence. And so we need to really explore how we grow in those areas. Uh, what, and and there've, been, there've already been a number of, of, of uh, at least one, one committee on campus recently uh, studied online education and the opportunities there and inventoried our capacity. Uh, I think we need to use that as a starting point and then figure out uh, where, where we need to go, where we need to go with uh, the infrastructure and how we uh, incentivize those sorts of programs. And then um, international, we need to think about international partnerships and maybe even um, uh, domestic partnerships. So, for example, um, a, a number of units on campus have um, arrangements for pipelines of students from, from Chinese universities to come to UK. Um, maybe there's similar opportunities with, with local universities. Maybe, maybe Bluegrass Community and Technical College. Maybe it's Transy. Maybe it's Berea. Um, perhaps we, we, we provide uh, innovative structures to get students from some of these uh, uh, local schools to transition into our graduate programs. Um, so those, those are discussions I think that can help us grow in a smart way. So why, why do I want the job? Um, well, I looked at the opportunities and the challenges and, and I think they require the following. One, uh, I think it requires what, what, what I call and what many of you know as, as servant leadership. Uh, what distinguishes servant leadership from just leadership? A servant leader is a servant first and a leader second. And, and an academic leader from department chair, associate dean, dean, provost, president, our role is to serve the students, the faculty, and the staff, and, and, and the commonwealth uh, to help, help you do your jobs better, to help you to grow professionally, um, and. That's, that's, what, that's what gets me fired up every morning, is, is to, to see the success of, of my colleagues and the successes of my alumni. And, um, and so I, I do want to serve. Um, I, think, I think we need someone who, who, who knows how to think like an entrepreneur, and in fact uh, is an academic entrepreneur. And uh, to, to take advantage of these opportunities and to develop the, the uh, this sort of the academic um, uh, um, entrepreneurial ecosystem requires someone with, with, with that kind of, of, of vision. And if, you know, I can, I, I, I can give examples, but I've been very uh, entrepreneurial as an academic. And 
creating new programs that have been very successful, generated a lot of money for, uh, for places that I've, that I've worked. And I, I think I understand, one, how to structure those programs, but two, how to, how to sell them. In other words, how to, how to attract funding, uh, how, to attract, how to attract students. Um, three, the job requires uh, someone to be a, uh, a strong collaborator. Um, many, many of you I, I know, many of you I've collaborated with, um, but there's, there's plenty of evidence, I think, around campus that I'm a willing collaborator. Um, I, I, I try to find solutions collaboratively. Um, I, you know, one, one weakness that I have, maybe it's a weakness, is I, I hate to say no. You know, if my colleague comes to me and, and wants help with something, um, the, first, the first answer out of my mouth is never no, it's, it's how, and does it make sense? And so I, I like finding a way to, to, to answers that help, help everyone. Uh, I also, I, I, I think the provost needs to have an appreciation for all of the academic areas on campus, both undergraduate and graduate, from the arts, the humanities, the social sciences, and, and all of the healthcare professions. And um, it, it is the provost for the University of Kentucky. That's the entire university. Um, am I an expert in every area of, of, of every unit on this campus? No, and no provost is. But, but I do know this, I have an appreciation for all of them. And, and I, I, I think that we have areas of strength in all of them, and uh, I want to explore how we, how we leverage all of those areas of strength moving forward. The, bon the bonus you get with me on, on, uh, is that is, is I, do, I have a business background. I'm not going to hide from that. Uh, I did work in industry. Uh, I've been a finance professor. Um, so I, I understand how very complex organizations work. Uh, that's what I've taught. Uh, when I was in consulting, I took very complex organizations apart and put them back together and figured out what they were worth and figured out how the money flowed and, and how to make things more efficient. And uh, a lot of those skills can be brought to bear uh, in the provost's office, especially in collaboration with, with the, the EVPFA uh, on, on how, to, how to make things more efficient and, and uh, to generate um, opportunities to improve our resource situation. So I, um, I always teach my students that if you want the job, you know, at the end of the interview, you've got to tell, the, tell them that you want the job. So <laughs> I, I'm going I'm, uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to say that I, I, I want the job. And, um, and I, I, I want the job because I, I sincerely, I, want, I do want to serve. I do want to serve. Um, I believe in this university, and I believe in Kentucky. Um, and many of you don't know this, but I spent my high school years in Kentucky, so it took me a long time to get back uh, six years ago. But I, I do have an appreciation for this state. Uh, I love this state, love this community, and I, and I want to give back. Um, checking my time. I'm running a little bit over. Uh, let me just say this about my vision for the provost office. Uh, the provost office is there to serve all of you. That's, that is the role of the provost office. And as provost, I want to make sure that, that, that we are serving our clients effectively and that everyone in the provost office brings that, that client service mentality to their job. So that, that's, a, that's a, a general approach I would have. Um, in terms of immediate priorities, uh, it's going to take some time for the new provost. Uh, if, it, if it's me, it's going to take time going around all over campus and, and, uh, and listening and learning. Um, and, and there's, a, there's a, you know, a lot, there's a number of initiatives in the provost's office, in the provost area that are ongoing. Um, you know, Tim, Tim's, uh, Tim's departure comes rather abruptly, so uh, I want to be clear that my intention is not to come in and turn the main building upside down and, and then try to put it back together. Uh, the immediate need is for stability. 
and, and so st to stabilize, stabilize the operation in the provost office, look, look, at, look at the um, initiatives that are underway, where they are, what, what, what's needed to get them across the finish line, and, and, and just get things stabilized. And that also applies also in, in the, in the uh, dean searches. Um, presuming that the president chooses either Donna or me to be the next provost, that puts seven dean vacancies on the table. That is more than a third of the deans on this campus that are, that are interim or, or, or will be vacant. Um, and that has to be addressed with, with urgency. Um, without stability in those dean's positions, everything else kind of grinds to a halt. And uh, it's not because the interim deans aren't doing a great job. It's that when you're interim, you're interim. And, and it's, it's, it's really hard to, 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 to make long-term decisions that are going to impact uh, your unit uh, if, you're, if you're not going to be there to be accountable for them long-term. So I think that needs to be uh, addressed uh, almost immediately. And then, of course, uh, whatever, I, whatever I can do to help, um, to help Eric, Tom Harris, the president, uh, with making the case in Frankfurt. Uh, there, there, there will be a case to be made in Frankfurt uh, this, this spring. And anything I can do to help, I will, I will offer. Uh, longer term priorities, the, uh, I think addressing uh, a number of issues with respect to graduate education including the future of the graduate school. Uh, that, that's something that is, has you know, been up in the air for, for some time, and I think a serious uh, effort to deal with that um, uh, very, you know, fairly urgently is important. Um, I think in incentivizing diversity and incentivizing uh, external research funding. Uh, that, that requires the provost to collaborate not only with the deans, but with the vice president for diversity and the vice president for research to make sure that we are you know, growing the research enterprise and that we are getting to a, a level of, 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 uh, of effectiveness and competitiveness on, on diversity and inclusion. And then uh, designing an entrepreneurial ecosystem in which the academic units can, can grow and thrive and, and generate the resources that, that each unit needs and that the university needs to continue on a path to excellence. And that, that is, uh, you know, the form of that. It, you know, I don't have any preconceived ideas about the form of that, but I know it's gonna take strong collaboration among the deans and the EVPFA to come up with a, a system of allocating resources to new programs so that those new programs can get started and thrive and, and, and support uh, the growth in, in faculty that we need and in staff that we need to, to sustain our excellence. Thank you very much for listening. I'm sorry I went quite a bit over, actually, but um, I'm happy to hear any comments or questions. In the local newspaper a few weeks ago, and there's a one concern raised. They said that among all the uh, president's leadership, there's a lack of diversity. Do you think that's a concern, or what's your comments? Uh, uh, that's the first question. Uh, the second is, uh, give one, if you have the major weakness for the university uh, needed to be uh, this challenge or, or one weakness, <coughs> just if you have. Sure. Uh, so the, the, the First question had to do with the, the, the reports about diversity of the president's leadership team. Yeah, yeah, um, and that you know that that um, I saw that same article or virtually the identical article appear over three years ago when when the, the, the provost search was going on. Um, look, look, diversity is is, is a, a a huge concern for the president and for the entire leadership team of the university. The, the article focuses on the top 10 leaders of the university. And the, the, the issue is that we, we need to give opportunity at, at the lower levels, especially department chairs, associate deans, and deans, 
and assistant vice presidents and associate provosts to, to have that pipeline of, of diverse talent that, that, that makes it, makes it to, the, to the very top. So that, that is a, a, a continuing concern. The, the other thing, though, is if you, if, you dig, if you dig down a little deeper and, and you go down to the dean level or associate dean level and department chairs and you start measuring diversity among all of the academic leaders at UK, I, I think you would see a much different picture with respect to diversity. Is it where it needs to be? No. And especially, I mean, especially African Americans, especially women. Um, and, and so there needs to be a focus on developing that talent. And, you know, I, I know that, uh, you know, GT's office is, is collaborating with, with Sanja's office and there's programming to, to develop that talent and, and hopefully keep it here. So, um, but I, I do think the president has an obligation to choose who he thinks is the best person for the job. Is there a weakness at UK? Sh sure. <laughs> I, I could open up the floor. Um, I think, but I, I'll, I'll say from my perspective and what's, what's, what's needed for us to sustain growth and, 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 and thereby sustain our excellence is, is we do... We do need more clarity on how resources are allocated and what uh, clarity on the incentives for, for things like diversity, external research, and, and growing programs. So, you know, I, I think things are, are less than, than perfectly clear, and I think if they are perfectly clear, uh, that everyone can, can, can thrive and contribute to that growth. Thank you. Yes. So I was glad to hear that you mentioned that you think there's you know, a case to be made in Frankfurt and that you would be expecting to work with state officials in new visions for UK if necessary. And I'm wondering about the extent to which your strategy for that might include engaging with the governor about further ideas he's floated about the way to change how the state appropriates funds to public universities, including funding students selectively in some disciplines but not others where their perception may be that ready-made jobs related to a major may not be waiting there. So I'll, I'll, I'll first admit that, that that question, the answer to that question is way above the, my pay grade now and above the pres, probably the provost's pay grade. But, um, you know, th those decisions really reside with, with or how we, how we address those mm -hmm those issues really resides with the president. Mm -hmm. And um, and so what, you know, I, cer I certainly will, will, will advocate with, you know, with, with the president and with Tom Harris and in collaboration with, with, with Eric Monday on, on making the case for the, you know, the, the rich array of disciplines here, here at UK. Um, the, you know, f fortunately given, you know, given the sentiment that's, kind of behind your question, uh, the whole impact of the performance funding model on the university uh, was a uh, rounding error. I think it, I think it was $60,000 last year that we gained in that, in that formula. Now, that doesn't mean the formula would continue like that forever. But I, 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 am, I am concerned about uh, some, some of the rhetoric uh, that, that appears to uh, not place as much value on, on the arts and the humanities as things like business and engineering. Um, I, I do think that as a land grant, we have an imperative to serve the workforce needs of the state. But if you, if you look at our graduates, they all go to work somewhere or they all go to graduate, graduate school somewhere. And uh, I, I think a, a better, uh, I mean, one, we need, we need to make the case and we were in a position where we have to make the case for, uh, you know, th things like humanities and arts. I mean, we we just have to make the case, and we know how to make the case, and we and we should, and I'll I'll contribute to to helping with that as appropriate. Um, but the other the other thing is that no matter what discipline a student chooses at UK, the student needs to leave with with skills that will lead to success in a workplace, because they're all going to go to work somewhere. So is that organizational behavior? Is it a little bit of accounting? Is it, you know, it, it, there's just some basic skills that uh, students should take away so that they can succeed in the workplace and we should focus on that as well. Okay. 
Dean Blackwell, first and foremost, let me thank you for your passion and your vision and putting yourself in the race for the provost position. It's very thank admirable. Thank you. Thank you. And second is, um, I'm Joe Chappelle, faculty member in the College of uh, Pharmacy and a long-term faculty member here at the University of Kentucky. And I would suggest that all of us here in this room are a product of the transformation in higher education that was defined 50 plus years ago, the multiversity concept. And we have a colleague here in the College of Education, Dr. Thielen, who has studied the evolution of higher uh, education. <clears throat> and he's noted uh, quite frequently that there's been an overemphasis on <clears throat> Pardon me, I, I share understand. your problem this morning. <laughs> <clears throat> uh, he he, he uh, is bothered in his writings, at least, uh, by the overemphasis of the business of education, that it has somehow um, um, diverted our attention from the higher ideals of an uh, institution of higher education. And I'd like you to comment whether you agree or disagree with that sort of um, uh, prognosis that uh, Dr. Thielen has provided in his writings. And, and if you feel there are higher purposes for an institution, a, um, a key institution like the University of Kentucky is to be for the state of Kentucky, how do we define that and articulate that higher mission? That is a very, very deep question and a, and a, and a challenging one. Thank you, Doug. Um, well, I, I believe in higher education uh, and the value of it. Um, I, of course, I come from a, uh, a very modest background, a first generation student, and uh, you know, I ser served some time in the military and came out and had the opportunity to, to uh, uh, you know, finish my studies, to get, a, to get a PhD, to achieve beyond anything that any of my family could have ever hoped for, given, given my background. And, um, and of course, I've seen it in my students and in, in my colleagues, the transformational impact of, of higher education. And there's, and, and I, the, the, the higher ideals you're talking about, I think, go beyond just you know, uh, uh, helping someone to get a job and, and to move up uh, the income ladder. And there, there is, there is a, uh, um, an innate uh, value to, to uh, a university. Um, it is, the universities are, 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 are the bastions of, of ideas. And, 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 and new ideas that improve not only the lives of the students and the faculty, but that have the potential to improve things for all of society. And so, uh, you know, essential to that is academic freedom. And, um, and so I, I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a believer in those ideals. I uh, have, um, and I haven't read much of Professor Thielen's work, but um, I'm going to if I get this job. <laughs> And, I, and I'm sure I'm going to be in his hip pocket for a little while. But um, I, 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 give, I give this book to the provost to come in. Oh, good. Well, <laughs> you'll, you'll <laughs> so, uh, yes, I'm a believer in those ideals. But and then, and then I say, but it's not but that I don't. It's the, that it's that we face realities, and some of these realities are beyond the control of any of us at the university. Um, and the fact, the fact is that, you know, since the end of World War II, uh, higher education has been heavily, heavily subsidized by the federal government and the state government. And, you know, for a large part of that time, we were, we're not held very accountable for how we, how we uh, use that money. But I think that, um, I think great things came, came out of that, came out of that freedom. Uh, I, th I think we just have to recognize that, that the landscape has changed. The fiscal realities are, are much different. And 
And I think if, if, if as, as a university, not just UK, but any university, um, we need to start thinking as if we were private. Not corporate, but private. And uh, private universities, the, the really good ones, are, 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 are thriving. And, um, and so as our fiscal realities adapt, we, we, have, we, we have to adapt, I think, and start thinking more like a, like a private university. Thank you, John. Good morning, Good morning. Dean Blackwell. Um, I want to thank you for what I think has been a very comprehensive, passionate, and knowledgeable discussion. Um, I'm, I'm very interested in how you're seeing things, and um, I am um, the chair of the Gender and Women's Studies Department. Uh, my name is Carol Mason, and I'm really looking forward to having a provost who is the right person in that job. Um, I'm enormously um, uh, persuaded by your discussion this morning, um, and I want to be an advocate for you. I'm especially interested in your business background because I don't understand it. I'm a humanities scholar. And when you say that you understand how very complex organizations work, I want to learn more about why that's an asset for this position and also what you mean by um, helping to design an entrepreneurial ecosystem in which academic units can thrive. Could you tell me a little more about that? Cer certainly, thank you. Um, so on the, on the first point, I'll, I'll just, uh, I had four years of industry experience, so I, I had a 13-year ac traditional academic career, you know, went, th went through the t tenure and promotion and, you know, have a, have, actually have a, at that time had a very strong research record for my field and thought I was a pretty good teacher too and uh, I had an opportunity to go into industry and, and I, as I put it at that time, I'd never had a real job and so um, I decided to go, to go give, it a, give it a shot. Um, the, the nature of the work was actually valuing, uh, valuing companies. Um, so, uh, so think about you know, uh, the, the, the price of a share of stock in the stock market. What, what are the factors that go into to determining that? And, and, and it all ties back to uh, the risk of the company, how, how risky it is, and how, um, how much cash they can generate from their, from their activities. And uh, so, so what, to, to, get, to get at the answer of what is this company worth, you really have to open up, you know, open up the hood of the car and look at all the moving parts and figure out how, how the money comes into the organization, how it moves through, and uh, understanding all of that is essential to, to knowing what the company should be worth. Uh, so, that, so that, at a high level, that, that's what I did. Uh, I also, it, and this relates to the part about the, 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 the um, entrepreneurial ecosystem, if you will. Uh, you know, part of, part of what uh, I had to do was advise boards of directors on how to structure incentives for their top executives or to structure incentives for different divisions in a multi-divisional firm. So there's some analogies there. And so those incentives really have to tie um, to the overarching goal of the organization. And, and so the way, the way that's accomplished in, in, uh, you know, in universities and in corporate settings is through, I think of it as informal contracts that exist among the different uh, parts of the organization, and the contract says if, if you do X, then you will, you will, you will get resources of Y. And, and, and so the, the, the ecosystem, so it's, it's, and it's very complex at, at most companies, but it's even more complex at a university. Um, and, and so I think that, vi that vision can, can help me in collaboration with the, the other members of the leadership team to figure out how, how do we are there some, some incentives that we can wire to make objectives of the university happen? And, you know, uh, an example is diversity. So if we, if we, want, we want more women in, in higher leadership positions, what, what incentives and what resources need to be generated and, and, or, or provided? And, and, and what kind of incentives um, should there be 
to, to, make, to make that happen. Um, it's, it's one thing to legislate. That's often not the best way to get things done. If you just set up the landscape and make it very clear to people how the resources flow, then they will follow the path and get you to the objective generally. Did I answer your question? That helps a lot. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Dean Blackwell, we have a question from the audience. How have you supported or encouraged the core of the land grant mission in your current or previous roles? If you have not had interaction with the land grant mission in the past, how would you perceive your involvement with the mission going forward? Sure. Um, the, uh, I guess first let me just address what um, I, I see the land grant mission means. Um, it, it, you know, it goes, it goes back uh, historically to the way the university was really funded. And it, it, really, it really means, uh, uh, the land grant mission really means translating, translating research into practice that elevates the lives of, of, of people in the, in the state, I mean, at, at its essence. And so how, how we elevate the lives of our students, our faculty, our staff, and more broadly, the, the citizens is, is an uh, import, important part of our mission, and it's, it's mandated, it's legislated, so we, we have to address it. In terms of, of my, ex my direct experience with that, um, it's mainly uh, been as, uh, in my role as dean of, of, uh, of, of the Gatton College, and we address that in a number of ways, largely, largely through our engagement with the business community. So beyond, beyond teaching our students, we do a lot of outreach to, to help organizations to perform better, much in the same way if you were um, you know, an extension agent uh, in Western Kentucky, Advising, you know, advising a farmer. Um, so we 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 do that uh, uh, a lot, and and that's largely through um, um, custom customized or even open enrollment in some cases um, education programs that are that are open to the public, or that uh, we would design for a company that that needs help. Uh, we also do outreach activities. So the uh, we produce the uh, Kentucky. Um, uh, Kentucky Economic Outlook Report, which is a, essentially a detailed analysis of the Kentucky economy, sector by sector, region by region. Uh, we roll that out in, in fe every February to uh, a large audience of, 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 of business executives, citizens, uh, policymakers, and that, that kind of helps, that helps them to, uh, to manage their businesses going forward or to make policy going forward. Um, and then we, you know, uh, we have the Von Allman Center for Entrepreneurship, and that is a vehicle for uh, not only helping local people and local businesses to, to, to grow or, to, or even get started, but also we help University of Kentucky faculty to commercialize the intellectual property that is developed through the research here at UK. And if you look at the Van Allman Center website, you'll see a long list of, of companies that have started up as a result of those efforts. Um, and, and those companies bring employment to the state and investment to the state. And so that's, that's sort of how I've addressed the land grant mission from my uh, role the last few years. All right, Dean Blackwell, we have uh, one more question and then we'll give you a chance to make any closing comments. Gatton has more international students in terms of the student body than other colleges. What's your vision for international student enrollment? Is there any concern for having too many or too few international students? Um, an answer, the short answer to the question at the end is, is yes. Um, it, it needs to be the right amount. Uh, if, if and I, I haven't looked at, at these, these data lately, but um, as a whole, the University of Kentucky lags in terms of proportion of international uh, student enrollment. And that's, that's not a concern necessarily because we need more international students to generate more non-resident tuition. It's part of, the, it's part of diversity. You know, if, if we want students from Kentucky to, to be able to function globally, 
they need to have the exposure to, to international faculty and international students uh, during their entire experience at UK. Um, but I, I, I mentioned competitiveness. Um, there, there is a huge demand for American-style higher ed in, in China. And uh, it, it is an opportunity. Do, uh, do we want 20% do we want of our student body to be Chinese? I, I, I think that's, no, I think that, that's not uh, what I would advocate. That's, that's too much concentration from one, one country. And there, have been, there are universities that are trying that strategy to sustain themselves. And it's very challenging, and it's, it, it doesn't often work for the students. So yeah, we should, we should bring in more international students, uh, but it should be done in a smart way, and it, it shouldn't be uh, overwhelming um, it, it, in the sense that if whatever student we bring here, whatever their background, we need to be prepared to address their needs. And, um, and so yes, uh, the Gatton College has had some focus, but our proportion of international students overall is, is still below the norm at, at business schools nationally. So I think we, we have room to grow that, and I think we should benchmark that and, 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 and approach what is more the norm for a, for a, a Research One university uh, without uh, going to the extent that it hurts the, the students that we bring here, it hurts their chances of success. Uh, well, for, first, thank you all for uh, participating this morning and, and for listening and for asking uh, great questions. Uh, just from your questions, I, I've, I've learned a lot. Um, and I just want, want you to know again that um, I'm very interested in the job. I see a lot of familiar faces in here and, 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 new, and, and new faces, but know that I sincerely want to serve. And um, I. I promise if I am selected, I will listen. Um, can't, always, can't always execute what, what each individual wants, but, but, I, but I do listen and, uh, and I do collaborate and I look forward.